Um, so, um, a little bit about me. So I work for the Backyard Habitat Certification Program. Um, and um, sorry, I had dogs contained and then now I've just had a dog show up. So um, um, I work for the program. And um, in addition to working for the program, I am also a, um, a garden designer. I also volunteer with Friends of Trees, and I am a uh, tree steward with the City of Portland Urban Forestry. Um, those are volunteer roles. Um, I'm a full-time gardener. Um, I do garden design and garden maintenance, and I have a design background. Um, so I tell you all that just so that you understand that I do not have a background in ecology or botany or those sciences. Um, and so I'm really good at bridging um, kind of all these different disciplines and putting together a big picture. And um, when it comes to more scientific questions and things like that, I will refer people to other professional folks. So um, I did have some pre-workshop uh, questions that came to me in advance and some of those were um, general and some were really detailed. So I just wanted you to understand where I'm coming from. Um, thank you also for the city of Gresham for hosting these webinars. Um, this week for Earth Day. Um, it's a really wonderful pivot in this difficult time of coronavirus and um, my thoughts go out to folks who are struggling with with those um, results from the coronavirus and um, thoughts for you. Um, and like I said, thank you Emily for being here to facilitate. So um, Okay, here is an overview of um, what we're going to talk about today. I do have a lot of information, and so I am going to be moving through some of this pretty quickly. So if you do have um, questions, like I said, um, put those up in the chat box. Um, if it makes sense, we'll hold those to the end. But if um, people have a point of clarification or people aren't following what I'm talking about, um, um, Emily will interrupt me and we'll, we'll address those questions. So. Um, the Backyard Habitat Certification Program is a coordinated program between two different organizations, so Portland Audubon and Columbia Land Trust. Um, Portland Audubon is um, one of Oregon's oldest, largest, and most revered conservation organizations. Since 1902, they have been promoting the understanding, enjoyment, and uh, protection of native birds, other wildlife, and their habitats. The organization achieves this conservation and activism um, through educational programming for um, children and adults. They have a 300 acre sanctuary, the Wildlife uh, Care Center, which rehabilitates injured animals, and um, also through volunteerism. Um, Columbia Land Trust, the other partner organization, a little bit less known, um, their mission is to conserve and care for the vital lands, waters, and wildlife of the Columbia River region through sound science and strong relationships. Um, they have now conserved more than 45,000 acres and have more than 3,000 supporters. Um, their work in our region now is in um, both Oregon and Washington, and they work in the Columbia River Basin, um, also with um, many of the tributaries, and they stretch from the Dalles down to the Pacific Ocean, so a really wide region. Um, so both organizations um, are partnered to offer this Backyard Habitat Certification Program. Um, so the, that program, um, um, that program, so Backyard Habitat um, is basically um, existing within both organizations for a habitat restoration perspective. Um, our yards are an effective way of expanding the size and value of anchor habitats in the city and the urban, urban and suburban interface. Um, and then creating corridors of biodiversity to connect other wildlands. Um, and then from an advocacy perspective, we're connecting people to their yards, but more importantly to the role that our yards play in the urban landscape and the role um, that we play in the broader conservation initiatives. So really important um, aspects. Um, so where we live, um, as many of you know, the Portland-Vancouver region sits an incredible ecological crossroads. So the confluence of the Willamette and the Columbia Rivers um, 
These are north, south, east, and west migration routes. Um, and, and then also we are on the Pacific Flyway. So millions of birds are migrating through our area uh, every year, over 200 bird species. And then other um, creatures are also migrating in here, um, salmon and other, other creatures. And then um, we also have uh, critical nesting and wintering habitat as well, so not just during migrations. Um, and then why is this important? So we have a lot of species in decline. 25% um, of common birds are in decline. Um, 30 species of birds, uh, uh, sorry, 30 species of bees, according to the Xerxes Society, are labeled possibly extinct or critically imperiled. And then according to ODFW, um, 58 species of fish, amphibians, and wildlife are listed as threatened or endangered um, in Oregon. Globally, one third to one half of all amphibian species are threatened with extinction. Uh, I could go on and on, but um, but this is this is the issue um, that's affecting a lot of uh, creatures. Um, so, in the big picture, our region is changing. Um, the Greater Portland Metro Area now supports 2.4 million people. More are expected to con to continue to come as we continue to grow, and we need strategies for um, absorbing this growth. Our country is changing, and more than ever before, the basic idea that our government has a crucial and regulatory role in the protection of public wildlands, clean air and water, species protection, all of these things are an issue and um, a big concern. And then, of course, globally, we're dealing with climate change. So um, that's the big picture. And then I'm gonna drill this down a little bit more. Um, but I feel like maybe I should pause here. Um, I haven't looked to see how many more people have signed in. Um, if I should do another welcome, um, where are we at with that? Emily, can we, can we check in for a moment? Yeah, I think a couple people did join um, and it looks like, yeah, it's just been the same hand raised. So yeah, you could probably just pause here for a couple questions. Okay, yeah, if anyone has questions or missed anything, um, please feel free to um, type in the chat box um, or a little hand applause or keep going or turn off the video or whatever you, uh, whatever you feel. Love a little feedback. Okay. <laughs> keep going, Erica. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, okay, so next slide. So um, I talked about some of the big issues. Um, so causes of decline in species. Um, so I have some scary statistics. I like to present the worst and the scary stuff first and then, then go on to what we can do about it and how to make it better. So um, I have a question for you. So anybody have an idea of a percentage of the U.S. landscape that's considered, considered still undisturbed? Any ideas? Um, think about that, type it in the chat box if you wanna make a guess, and I'm gonna throw out a few more things here. So approximately 48 million acres of a lawn exist in the U.S., so that's 75,000 square miles of grass. I mean lawn grass not grassland. Um, that's slightly smaller than the state of Michigan. Um, research estimates that there's a one-to-one -one relationship of habitat destruction and species decline. So that's about 50. So if you think of 50% of a natural area being destroyed, 50% of the species are lost. Um, so we had a few people, or I guess just one. So somebody guessed 5%. Um, it is about 3 to 5%. Uh, three to five percent of the U.S. landscape is considered still undisturbed. Yeah. Yep, it's pretty low. So, um, so loss of habitat, big thing, loss of habitat, climate change. So those are our big issues, um, our big overarching issues. Um, these are things that we as um, communities and individuals have a little more say on here. Uh, introduced species of plants and animals, um, and then other human hazards kind of associated with our communities and our, um, our built environments. Um, so 
Things like introduced species like house cats, um, they have a huge impact on um, wild birds and, and other creatures. Um, our human structures, so light pollution, window strikes um, for birds, these are huge numbers of, of um, bird loss. And then pesticides, and I want to make a point to say that pesticides uh, is considered an umbrella term for any kind of chemical treatments that we apply outside of our homes in our, in our space. So pesticides, herbicides, all of those things, fertilizers. Um, and then noxious weeds. And I'll talk in a moment about noxious weeds and how they are not just your common dandelions. So um, Douglas Tallamy, uh, fairly famous um, ecologist, writer, author of Bringing Nature Home, researcher, he, he once said, we have to raise the bar on our landscapes. In the past, we have asked one thing of our gardens, that they be pretty. Now they have to support life, sequester carbon, feed pollinators, and manage water. So There's a lot more than we're used to. Um, I think of it as sort of the difference between what, what you might call conventional gardening and traditional gardening, which I like to think is more in sync with nature and more of a partnership. So urban gardeners have more power to do this, to nurture that um, environment. A backyard habitat certification program that I work for is also trying to nurture and support you in that effort. 40% uh, of our region is in our yards. And so in these areas, we have the power to change um, how we do that and to maybe make the common birds, keep them common. So I'm gonna talk um, about the backyard habitat certification program and how it works. Um, so briefly, uh, there's a one-time sign-up fee. You can enroll online. Um, from that, you will get um, a request to schedule a visit with someone like me. Um, I come to your yard, walk around, look at what you have, talk about your priorities, what you might want to do, um, it share with you a lot of other resources, coupons for uh, nurseries. Uh, from that visit is a uh, customized report um, that looks that um, gives you suggestions for your your space, plant suggestions, other things that you might do um, based on the conversation that we had, and then it gives you homework, stuff that you can do to start um, making a change in your space. Uh, hopefully, then you get certified or request a certification visit, and then share that more with your community. Start um, start sharing what you're doing, uh, showing off that sign. I get lots of questions as people uh, walk past my yard. Uh, what are you doing? How? Why? I share plants online with, um, with neighbors, uh, next door, things like that. So it can be a way to create more community. I like to think of it as it is. Um, and then there's always the opportunity to upgrade your certification and uh, do more. Um, so there are three certification levels. We do try to make the silver certification pretty attainable and really introduce those principles and concepts for you um, and then just start to move the meter a little bit and then for the people who are inclined to really go forward and do more and, and upgrade that certification level. Um, so the homework consists of um, the five criteria for certification. Um, so looking at the presence of noxious weeds, so these are um, uh, invasive weeds that are really disruptive in the environment. Um, native plantings in a nature-scaped arrangement, so creating a grouping of native plants. Um, reducing or eliminating the use of pesticides in your yard. Again, that's kind of any chemical treatments outside your home. And then um, offering wildlife stewardship activities. Um, that's a, there's a whole menu option of wildlife stewardship and also rainwater management. Um, and so you can do a variety of different things. I like to think that it really gives people an opportunity to find um, the things that really inspire them and figure out how to work those into their space. Um, I love doing the, the habitat visits because um, it, it, it's always, um, every, everyone's unique and each visit is different and people come at this from so many different interests and uh, inspirations and motivations. Um, so it's really fun. Um, so looking at noxious weeds. So noxious weeds, um, oh, and I'll just answer this question because I happen to see it um, about COVID and the initial site visit. So for right now, 
Um, we are not able to do site visits. Um, for those of you um, that uh, in the beginning said that you are already enrolled in the program, we are doing um, con consultations, kind of more in-depth consultations by phone or this sort of a platform um, video call. And um, so we'll be doing that for people who are already enrolled in the program. However, for folks who are not enrolled in the program yet or just enrolled, um, we aren't able to do that. There are the, the resources online and um, hopefully we can just catch up with people when we can start going and visiting again. Um, but we have talked about that and how to even do some social distancing at people's yards um, as needed and as it makes sense. Um, so removing noxious weeds. So noxious weeds, um, these are not dandelions. These are not uh, bitter crests that's been popping, popping uh, lately this, this season um, out in your gardens. This, these are um, ecological disruptors. So um, noxious weeds um, are going to be listed by agencies, watershed councils, so water conservation district offices, things like that, um, as um, sometimes they're called noxious weeds, sometimes they're called invasive weeds, sometimes they're called nuisance weeds. Um, but they are ecological disruptors and um, they act in a lot of different ways that make them really suppress and overwhelm uh, native and even ornamental um, yard plants. So they outcompete natives. They may remember these are these are invasive, so they've come from somewhere else. Um, they may lack predators, pests, or diseases. They are really great at seed dispersal or germination or colonization. They find a little niche and they exploit it. Um, they may um, be able to do vegetative growth. So that may mean that you've dug it up, chopped it up, but you've left a few little pieces and any piece that's touching the ground um, can root and regrow. Um, they may have a growth cycle or a season um, that they really exploit um, that's different. Uh, Lesser celandine is an example of that one. Um, comes out really, really early in the spring before anything else is really up. So it's really finding that little niche and exploiting it. Um, and then some are allelopathic. And so that may, means that they um, in some way alter the soil around them, whether it's nutrients or um, putting out, um, secreting something into the soil around them that helps them succeed and other plants around them um, struggle. Um, and by now, they don't all do all of these things, but um, but these are some of the aspects that they may incorporate to be so um, effective. Um, and by doing that, they decrease biodiversity. Um, you may have seen big, um, vast swaths of ivy or undisturbed, um, you know, untended yards or or empty lots that are overwhelmed by blackberry or riparian zones that are full of butterfly bush. Um, these are examples of how these things will just uh, start to create a monoculture and try to kind of overwhelm the habitat area. Um, so again, noxious weeds are not the same thing as common garden weeds. Um, so then looking at native plants. So one of my favorites to talk about. Um, so native plants, um, um, you can see at the bottom of the screen the different um, certification levels require a different amount of native naturescaping. So, um, and that is a percentage of your plantable area. It's not your total lot space. So it's just plantable area. Um, and even a really small amount can really make a difference. Um, when we talk about native plants, um, I think it's important to say native to where. So everything's native somewhere. And um, when you go to a nursery, you may see a native plant section and they may be talking about uh, Western US. They may be talking about Rocky Mountain. They may be talking about Oregon or Pacific Northwest or Puget Sound. Um, you know, it, it could be any definition. And so it's important to understand what somebody else is talking about when they're talking about native. So for purposes of this program, we look at a somewhat um, hyperlocal um, definition. So you can see the red uh, dashed circle around the Portland metro area. So lower Willamette Valley, it's roughly 50 miles around Portland. Um, these are the plants that are listed in the Portland plant list. And I encourage you to check that out if you haven't seen it. You can easily Google it and find it. Um, it describes the different kinds of um, habitat areas. 
Uh, there are six or eight of them, and it talks about the different plants that are associated with those habitat zones. Um, so those are native to our local um, area. Um, and then I also need to point out um, the issue of cultivars. So if um, you go searching for plants at a nursery, you're going to find a lot of different kinds of plants. Some of it are going to be cultivars. Cultivars have been cultivated by the nursery trade for certain characteristics. Um, it could be um, something as benign as more pest or disease resistant. Um, it could be something entirely different like um, a different color of foliage or a different uh, kind of flower or a longer blooming flower. There's many, many, many different reasons. They might cultivate, uh, cu cultivate certain characteristics. Um, and whether or not a native plant that has been cultivated in some specific way still has the benefits that it had as a native plant um, as it was is anybody's guess. So it's probably still more beneficial than an exotic plant. However, we can't know without researching each and every one and the nursery trade is always coming out with new ones. So we can't do that. So for that reason, we don't count cultivars as native plants when we calculate um, your nature scaped area in the program. Um, but that doesn't mean they're bad. So I just wanted to point that out. When you see a um, showy little name on a plant tag that maybe has little quotation marks around it, um, that usually indicates that it's been cultivated in some way for some specific characteristic. Um, so if you have other questions about that, we can talk about it more later too. Um, and Teresa has a question about a different definition of native in Portland. Um, so we really just drill down to the using the Portland plant list as our guide to what's considered locally native. Um, I would, I think that kind of what you're talking about is getting to the issue more of those different habitat zones and looking at, uh, you know, is this a rocky outcropping like near where I live, which uh, Rocky Butte, someplace like that, or is it um, riparian zone, um, conifer habitat, Douglas fir kind of con conifer habitat, um, like much of the West Hills is going to be much more of that heavy um, forest canopy. Um, so there's, like I said, it's six to eight um, different habitat zones in our local area and um, those are spelled out specifically for um, areas like Rocky Butte is listed as Rocky Outcroppings. Um, and then the descriptions of what those are, and there are plants associated with those different, the, the Portland plant list um, spells that out very clearly, um, the different plants that are associated with those habitats. Um, so I hope that's helpful to answer your question. Uh, yes, um, so someone has asked about um, climate change. Um, that is something that we're definitely looking at and we continue to have conversations about. The Portland plant list is based on historical norms um, and, and we do continue to talk about that. Um, at the end of the day, um, we have to consider right plant, right place. Um, I know in my yard I have tried different plants and tried to push the, the ranges of different plants, but um, ultimately if we want to be considering um, uh, efficiency in our gardens and not overwatering or trying to create different situations in our yard and we're using right plant right place um, that's going to ultimately be the, the sign of what's effective and, and um, efficient too. Um, I hope that answers your question. Um, like I said, Emily, do do catch me up if I miss questions or if I don't, if somebody doesn't feel like their question is fully answered. Um, and, and this might be a good place to, to pause and um, um, see if, if people have other questions. Um, but, but yeah, thank you, Susan. The Portland Plant is, is a great place to, to read about all of this. It has information, uh, like I said, about the different kinds of habitat zones, um, a list of all the different plants with great detailed information about their preferred habitats. Um, at the back of the Portland plant list is also more information about the noxious or nuisance weeds and um, uh, resources for um, how to manage them and eliminate them. Um, more, there's also information about 
wildlife and, and, and the different native plants that they like and the, the um, most beneficial specific species of plants for wildlife. So there's lots and lots of information in the Portland Plant List. So I encourage you to check it out. It's freely available online as a PDF um, and you can download it and you can buy hard copies and things like that. So. Um, and I just wanted to also say, um, remember to use the chat function, not the Q&A, um, because the Q&A is a little bit more difficult to use. There's a couple of questions in the Q&A, actually. Oh, okay. Are, is there any way you could copy those over, or if people um, didn't get their question answered, maybe type yeah, it in? Yeah, I'll put those into the chat. Thank you, Emily. And I'm just going to do a quick time check. Yeah, we did start a little bit late, so I think we will go a little bit later. Um, so why native plants? Um, so I did just explain to you about how this is um, kind of a hyper-local view of, um, of native. Um, and basically the reason is, there's a very specific reason. So uh, native plant communities evolved over 4.6 billion years ago. Um, those plant species evolved in tandem with insect populations. Um, so we have invasive insects as well as plants and those invasive insects tend to be kind of generalists and they're going to nibble on this and nibble on that and they're not real particular. But native insects are usually specialists. They are particular. They do need specific plant species and those um, relationships are really important and as we plant more and more ornamentals or exotics or have um, you know the nuisance species come in as well, we lose that relationship. And those insects are the building blocks of our food web. Um, so all the different birds that we love, the other mammals, um, and then even into our, um, affecting our food growing for us as well. So um, there's a really important relationship and um, the more we get away from that, the more we interfere with it and um, break up that connectivity, um, it means that we lose a lot of biodiversity um, and poten potentially create unforeseen consequences. Um, when it comes to a lot of ornamental plants, those ornamentals tend to come from a really narrow set of plant families. They're usually um, used because of aesthetics only. Um, also for ease of propagation. Uh, they tend to be sterile because we don't want messy fruits on our driveways and patios and things like that. Um, and we lose a lot of genetic information that helps these plant species to evolve and adapt. And then, like I said, we have a lot of unforeseen consequences. So it's a really important interconnected web. And um, that's why we are using this somewhat hyper-local um, list of plants, um, but the Portland Plant List is a really fantastic resource for us, and we are lucky to have it. So then I'm going to talk a little bit more about what I mean by naturescaping. So I talked about native plants, um, but I've also mentioned uh, naturescaping. So here in this illustration, you see the five different uh, canopy layers or vegetation layers listed. Um, on the left, it shows you some of the birds associated. So these different canopy layers provide food and habitat for different kinds of foraging. Um, so we have seed and berry eaters, we have ground feeders, we have foliage gleaners, which are typically insect eaters, and aerial foragers, which are birds that um, maybe fly catch, um, and then also a lot of predators, might be birds that eat other birds. Um, so this represents a diversity of vegetation. We encourage a varying grouping and density this provides cover and also organic debris for ground insects like beetles, and in turn, the uh, ground feeding birds and other wildlife. Um, I also like to point out that in the middle, that understory canopy and the large shrub layer, I think of this as the shrub layer in general, 60% um, of the birds um, that, that we have in this region live in that shrub layer. 60%, um, that's a huge number. Um, this shrub layer provides um, uh, food for foraging. It provides uh, habitat for uh, nesting and raising young. 
um, and also cover from predators. It's super important. It's the, it's the layer two that we tend to leave out when we want more open sight lines in our urban and suburban environments. Um, but it's also has many beneficial things uh, for us as well as um, birds and other wildlife um, that I'll get to a little bit later when I get to some of the tips and tricks at the end. Um, somebody asks what um, some examples of some of the plants that fall into these categories or layers. Um, sure. Um, so the upper canopy layer is going to be the mature trees. So our Doug firs, our western red cedars, our Oregon oaks, our big leaf maples. Uh, the understory canopy are our smaller trees like vine maple or cascara. Um, even hazelnut can, can sometimes be classified in that. Um, it's kind of a sh shrubby tree. Um, the large shrub layer is going to be the red flowering currant, the mock orange, your elderberries, uh, the native elderberries. Um, small or medium shrub layer is going to include um, things like evergreen huckleberry, um, snowberry, um, our spireas, um, even uh, sword fern, which is a very large fern. Um, and then the ground layer, obviously uh, ground cover plants, uh, inside out flower, trilliums, um, ginger, um, all of our wildflowers, all of those herbaceous, perennials, and annuals. Um, okay, then um, the third criteria for backyard habitat certification um, is going to be about pesticides. So um, we use the Grow Smart, Grow Safe website from Thurston County and Puget Sound as, um, as our guide to what's considered um, um, most noxious and uh, most important to remove from our yard. So it's a really robust website, lots of information. The pesticides page specifically has a functionality where you can type in by brand name or ingredients. It gives a red, yellow, or green zone rating. Um, it, it offers, it can also offer you suggestions for, for greener, safer alternatives. Um, in our program, we recommend, we require removal of red zone and then encourage you to reduce to potentially, you know, hopefully to green or, or no chemicals, um, you know, um, ideally using, uh, you know, vinegar, maybe, maybe sluggo, um, that, that kind of thing only, and um, not using any of the more powerful chemicals outside. Um, and, um, and, it, and for some people, it's a real shift in thinking about it. You know, we encourage people to, to learn about integrated pest management and understand that about how to um, do kind of the least that we have to do to interfere. Um, if any of you are familiar with neonicotinoids, um, this has gotten a lot of, a lot of press over the years. Um, in our region in 2013, there was a, a horrible event that really made national news when um, some trees in a Target parking lot were sprayed. Um, and uh, one Saturday morning, 50,000 bees potentially, um, that was one estimate, fell out of the sky um, because of the treatment that had been applied to these trees for, I think it was aphids. Um, you know, I've had aphid infestations in my yard and it's unsightly and it's kind of gross, um, but they don't usually kill plants. And um, I had a huge, in my yard when that happened, um, the aphids were there, it was kind of gross. I was watching it for a few days. And then the ladybirds, ladybugs came in in mass and just overwhelmed the aphids and cleaned it all up. And without that, those ladybugs wouldn't have had food. So um, I was really glad I didn't interfere. Um, so that's just one example. If you don't know about neonicotinoids, they were first, you see the tag there, they were first introduced as a way to um, manage a lot of pests. And then we started to realize that in fact, um, they are systemic treatment on a plant and they're there for the lifetime of the plant. And so they're not just affecting those insects, but they're also affecting any pollinator or any creature that might nibble on them. So if you don't know about neonics, I encourage you to learn more. Um, again, thinking in terms of unintended consequences here and us trying to interfere with um, a system. Um, the last two categories for um, backyard habitat certification are um, 
wildlife stewardship and stormwater management. And these two categories are both um, offer you kind of a menu option for you to choose from. So you see on the right where you, you have to do one from each category to um, get certified and then we encourage you to do more um, for the higher certifications or as you are interested. So um, these are, I'll go a little bit more into this uh, later, but um, these are things like um, providing a clean water source. This can be a, a fancy water feature. It can be a fountain. It can also be something super simple like a tabletop bubbler. It can literally even be the dog's water bowl that you keep clean all the time on the patio. Um, any kind of water, water feature. Um, snags and nurse logs. So declining dead, I'm sorry, I, I went out of order from what you're seeing. Um, bird and bat nest boxes can be really fun. Um, educational insect nesting habitat. So that can be um, a brush and rock piles. It can also be mason bee houses where you're uh, nurturing native bees. Um, snags and nurse logs. So a standing dead tree or a downed dead tree. Um, declining dead and decaying wood is all super important habitat for bugs and beetles and a lot of other creatures that feed on them. Um, it's really important to re-nutrify the soil. Um, so reducing outdoor lighting. Um, so here again, thinking about our built environment, um, our, um, there's a lot of new research about the effects on our outdoor lighting, both on human health, as well as um, migration routes for birds and, and moths and, and a lot of other creatures. Um, if you have problems with bird strikes currently on your windows, we of course want to encourage you to uh, reduce and eliminate those. Um, and then a native pollinator meadow can be a really fun way to create um, pollinator food throughout the seasons um, and to start to reconnect some of those fragmented habitats of pollinator meadows. Um, and then keeping cats safe at home. So um, this can be a little controversial. Um, some people really like to let their cats free roam. It's, it's a big impact on, on birds and other creatures. Um, I had some, I had some recent numbers. I think um, in 2019, the Wildlife Care Center had um, uh, they rehabilitate over 4,000 birds and animals a year in general. Um, those are the creatures that get brought to them uh, still alive. Um, cats, cat strikes, cat uh, attacks are the number one reason for the intake of creatures. And in 2019, it was almost a thousand creatures were brought to them. So those, you figure those are the ones that lived long enough to make the car ride to the care center. Um, and those are the creatures that even got found. Um, so cats are a really huge impact on this. So and there's can... a couple questions in the... Oh, thank you. Yes. Um, let's see. Susan talked about aphids. Um, yeah, Lights Out Portland campaign. Um, is really good at, yeah, there's a lot of new research about um, the lights and um, our, our, the effects on us. Uh, nurse logs, how to be sure you are not, uh, yeah, uh, definitely if you have, um, like, say for example, you had a tree, a maple tree um, that you took down because of, of verticillium wilt or any, any kind of other disease, um, like um, a fungus or something, um, I would encourage you to remove that wood from your property. However, um, if you don't have a concern about that, um, yeah, using it is great. Um, Verticillium wilt is a tricky one because it's, it moves around so easily. Um, and so I don't have a, a definite answer for you how to be sure. Um, do your, use your best judgment. If you think you might have it, I would remove it. Um, I know I had um, pine bark beetle in a pine that we had to take down and we had to remove all the wood. And it was a real bummer because I would have liked to use that for firewood and a nurse log in the yard, um, but we, we definitely felt we needed to remove it. Um, so there's a lot of things to consider here. Yeah. Thank you for your comment, Mimi. Um, and then the last category, um, let's see. Oh, I, I should actually, I have one more comment about um, cats here too. Um, the rate of rehabilitation for birds and creatures that have been attacked by a cat is extremely low. Um, they don't usually survive. Um, 
And I would encourage you to think about a catio. Um, a lot of people are moving their cats um, indoors and using catios or cat enclosures, cat patios to give their uh, cats some outdoor time that's safe for the cat and for other creatures. So um, managing rainwater in our yards. So stormwater management. Um, Um, so lots of things that we can do here to manage storm water. So large canopy trees um, can be amazing at processing water. So Doug firs, especially uh, some of our iconic Northwest native species, Doug firs and, and Western red cedars, can process thousands of gallons. I think it's even tens of thousands of gallons of water in like a 24 hour period. It's phenomenal what they can do. It's partly because they're big and they have a, a robust root system, but also because those big root systems have lots of mycorrhiza and microorganisms that are also in there living and processing the water themselves. Um, they're also managing erosion with those big root systems. And um, also because of those root systems being so robust and deep, um, and vast. They're also helping that water to percolate and infiltrate into the ground, into the soil. So lots of benefits from large canopy trees. Um, other things, um, disconnecting downspouts. So you can see in the picture there on the left where somebody has diverted the water away from the house with a, um, a connection um, from the downspout out into the yard, so not into like a stormwater drain or, or other sort of apparatus. Uh, for directing the water um, off-site. So here they're using that water, they've, create, they've removed some of the lawn and they've created some sort of a, a rain garden. Uh, it looks to me like maybe it's a, a younger rain garden, um, so the plants are smaller. You can use small plants, you can use rock, you can use larger plants. Um, there's an infinite uh, variety of how these uh, rain gardens can be created. Um, I would call this one a very simple one. They can be much more elaborate, but they don't have to be. So, um, like I said, disconnecting downspouts and rain gardens often go hand in hand, but they don't have to. Uh, removing lawn, here you've, you've seen that um, applied also in that photo. So, in this context of stormwater management, impermeable surfaces and lawn are kind of hand in hand. We're, we're kind of putting them, lumping them together. So, lawn grass holds um, water really shallowly on the surface of the, the ground. You've been out in that swampy, squishy winter lawn. Um, so it's holding a lot of that water on the surface. So in, in, um, in effect, it's like an impermeable surface. So switching um, to permeable um, hardscape perhaps, or um, also removing some lawn areas. An eco roof can be a fun thing to do on a shed or a small outbuilding perhaps. Um, naturescaping higher than your certification level. Uh, restoring soils, that's about leaving the leaves, allowing um, naturally uh, decaying um, leaves, branches, uh, debris from, from your um, uh, plants to just naturally decay. Um, that's really important for a lot of ground feeding birds. Um, and then water conservation is about eliminating the use of um, lawn irrigation and any irrigation that you are doing on um, young plants or um, fruits and vegetables, things like that, um, that's really intentional with drip or timers, that sort of thing. And then eco-friendly maintenance is about uh, eliminating the use of gas-powered equipment as a regular thing. So switching from a gas mower to electric or even not even needing a, a lawn mower anymore, it's not about a one-off chainsaw or something, it's, it's about regular gas powered equipment. Um, so does that make sense to everyone? Um, and then again, this is a menu option for you to choose from as with the last category, um, and then hopefully doing more as we go up. I'm gonna do a quick time check. Um, any questions we need to address right now? I'm gonna do some um, conclusions and some tips and tricks, some little some little examples of some of these things and how they can get applied. Teresa says she's got a, a longer question about redirecting the stormwater, but... Yeah, Teresa sent a question in advance, um, and I, 
I'm afraid it's, I'm not going to be able to um, completely address it. Although I did do a little bit more research. Um, Teresa has, has an issue with um, drainage toward her house because of some hardscape that was um, uh, installed in her yard. And she's having to try to, to figure that out after the fact. Um, I did do a little more research specifically to your question though about redirecting stormwater towards a Douglas fir, a mature Douglas fir. So um, often when we are redirecting stormwater, there's an issue of, okay, where do I put it? Um, you know, all of our yards are not like this photo in this slide, flat. Um, with space between yards. Um, some yards are very sloped, some yards are right above or on top of a neighbor. Um, some yards are very kind of terraced where you get um, weird runoff situations and you, as much as you want your neighbor to look out for where they're directing their water towards you, you want to do the same to your neighbor downhill. Um, so it can be very tricky and I realize that. Um, and particularly in certain areas like the West Hills where you've got um, very um, very sloped um, angles and houses on stilts and that sort of thing. So um, it's it's definitely something that gets to the place where I start to refer you to a geo engineer or um, somebody who is way more technically um, educated than I am about those issues. Um, and I'm sorry if that doesn't answer the question the way you want to. Um, because it's not simple and it's going to be very specific to your space and your property. Um, definitely there are certain principles that I, I encourage you to think about not installing um, hardscape so that water is going to flow into your house. I had a situation like that. It was very tricky. We had to remove the hardscape and replace the silt plate and create new drainage. I've known a lot of people who have had to install French drains around their house because of things that previous owners have done. Um, and maybe even before they knew about um, rain gardens and redirecting stormwater. It, it can be very tricky and challenging and it can take a while to figure it out so that it works. Um, but to, specific to the question about um, where to direct the water, um, there are certain plants that don't like um, water directed towards them. There are some really great resources about rain gardens and about the plants that do like wet feet or being even in the water seasonally. Um, most plants are adapted, native plants are most, are still really adapted to our kind of more drought summer conditions and they're going to want to dry out seasonally. Um, certain plants like an Oregon oak tree or Oregon white oak um, do not like wet feed and they do not want that water directed towards them. Um, but I don't think a Doug fir would mind having that water directed towards them seasonally uh, so that they're I mean, not waterlogged all year, but seasonally wet. That's pretty normal and natural in our um, our region. And um, I had never heard that before, that it should not have water directed towards it. So that was new to me. I would consult an arborist for sure, um, but I had never heard that before. So, uh, okay to send water via a redirected downspout. So yeah, definitely um, there are all different ways that you can redirect water from your house. Um, you know, you can, in my yard, I have water directed away from the house under a path out to a sort of faux um, uh, uh, stream, like a, a little rocky stream area feature in my yard. Um, you can direct water um, away from the house in all different sorts of ways, whether it be visible or invisible, buried, above ground, you know, there's all infinite number of ways you can figure that out um, very creatively. Um, yeah, and, and, it, and sometimes it can be challenging. Um, the Oregon, um, I don't have it here in front of me, the, um, there's some really, on our website, there's some really great um, resources about the, about rain gardens and um, how to bridge pathways and, um, or span pathways, I should say, paved areas, um, different kinds of attachments that you can use to redirect the water. Yeah, I hope that's helpful. Um, yeah, I have seen yards where um, water is redirected into kind of green spaces and things like that. 
I would say that that's always going to be individual, um, whether that's acceptable or not. Um, and I've also seen that where it may not be strictly okay, but people have done it. I'm not promoting that. I'm just saying I've seen all different sorts of things. Uh, sometimes the water is directed right under the street. Uh, you name it, I've seen it. Um, there's all different ways of managing stormwater and um, they're not all great, but there's all infinite number of, uh, of approaches. And um, so I would just really encourage you to think about where's that water gonna go? If I've created a collection for it somewhere, um, what happens if it overflows? Where will it go then? Um, you always wanna get it away from your house, um, particularly if you have a basement or if you're on a, on a steep slope and er erosion is a concern. Generally speaking, it's at least six feet away from your house. Um, but with erosion, there might be other concerns. Um, so I hope I hope that's a, a good enough answer for now. Um, but there are other resources, and um, I would encourage you to look look for those. Thanks. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. So tips and tricks for saving money in your yard. So lots of different. Um, Resources that you already have that you might not have considered, uh, leaves, branches. Uh, sometimes I go to yards and somebody's like, oh yeah, I'm taking that tree down. Uh, that's gonna happen really soon. And I'm like, why? Can you use it? Don't get rid of it. <laughs> um, so maybe it's great as a standing dead tree. Maybe you wanna use it on site as a, as a nurse log. Um, maybe you have leaves that you're hauling away on a regular basis and why? I mean, sometimes there's a reason and I get that. Um, and it doesn't mean that you leave leaves where they land, but um, can you use them on site somewhere, somehow? Um, brush piles. Um, I create a brush pile. I have a really public yard, so I don't have a lot of room for brush piles permanently. But every fall, I create a brush pile because I get uh, gorge winds, and I just try to create some, some um, wind breaks in my yard especially around where the bird feeders are, just to create um, some shelter for the birds and some, some little wind breaks. Um, so wooden branch piles, maybe they're permanent, maybe they're not. Um, it doesn't always make sense in every single yard, but um, lots of resources here. Um, chip drop is a free resource for um, tree chips, uh, wood chips, mulch. Um, a lot of times you can get free plants on Craigslist or Nextdoor or Friends of Backyard Habitat Facebook page. I posted on those before. Um, right plant, right place. So I talked about that before. Really important for the most efficient, effective use of your resources. Um, create a plan. Take one step at a time. Um, don't be afraid to um, think about multiple seasons, multiple years. How am I going to tackle this? Break it down. Don't let yourself get overwhelmed, but figure it out so that you can keep going. Um, and plant during fall weather. So um, during the dormant season is the best because it gives the plants a chance to get the roots established. Um, that's going to mean less pressure from the drought summer and that means less watering for you. So if you possibly can plant in the fall and we've been working with nurseries to get them to stock more in the fall, to offer more native plants in the fall and so that those will be available to you. And then ask questions, try to try to work with the community. Obviously, right now, especially online, Friends of Backyard Habitat is a really fun website to check out um, on Facebook. So check that out. Um, Jean, or, uh, yeah, Jean asks about how long it takes for leaves to decompose. Um, that's, oh, you get overwhelmed. Yeah, uh, especially big leaf maples um, can be really overwhelming. Um, certain oak trees like red oaks, big, big trees can be very overwhelming. Um, it can take a while depending on conditions. Um, it depends a lot on conditions. You know, we had a pretty dry winter this year. I would expect them to probably have been hanging around longer. A wetter season, they're going to they're gonna move along, uh, decompose a little quicker. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to depend a lot on conditions and even conditions in your yard specifically, um, if you have more shade or sun. Um, Sometimes people will run a lawnmower over them. I have a, a leaf blower that also has a vacuum function where it can like mulch the leaves into the vacuum and then I spread them into my flower beds. Um, if you can do something like that or put them in a composter to help them along if that's a concern, 
um, but that's still really beneficial um, if you can, you know, that might just help you to get through the, the excess if you feel overwhelmed. So just, just thinking of approaches to help you um, to deal with it. Um, so free and discounted plants. Um, so Backyard Habitat certification has coupons for nurseries for program participants. Um, we are continuing to work with more and more nurseries. We're trying to um, get it so that we have native plants access to all the communities where our program is participating. Um, we continue to work with those nurseries to try to um, help them understand why and why this is important and to expand their nursery stock and to be aware of the Portland plant list so that they're not offering a lot of coastal natives as local natives or confusing people. Um, so we're continuing to do those things to help educate everyone and offer you more resources. Um, there are other um, resources for native plant sales in our region, especially in the spring. Um, um, but also like uh, East Multnomah Soil Water Conservation District has their sale early, um, like in February. So that's a pretty good time still to be planting. Very reasonable prices because they're doing um, bare roots. So lots of other resources. Um, and I'm going to keep going here and some of those will present themselves. Um, so on a budget, um, growing plants from seed. So that can be a great way to save some money and learn more about the plant. Um, so you, there are lots of resources for seed. Um, also hardwood cuttings. Uh, do you have a friend who has some native plants? Do you um, have some already and you can propagate from your own stock? Uh, do remember when you are taking cuttings that they are genetically identical. So it would be beneficial to get cuttings from different sources and not just one plant in your yard that are basically all in the same plants. Um, but I give away plants all the time. I'm happy to share cuttings, so um, seek out opportunities like that. Um, these are plants that are um, excel in offering um, their services to wildlife. So the number of species listed are birds or other wildlife uh, mammals. So these are the top cream of the crop, I'll say of the plants that are um, really beneficial. Um, and this list is in the Portland plant list as the wildlife beneficial plants, if you wanna look at that some more. Um, plant a native hedgerow. So I recommend this at almost every single yard I go to. Um, so we talked a lot about why the shrub layer is important for birds and, and other creatures, but it's also the, the section, it's the, it's the um, it provides at our yard a lot of things that we want in our yard. So privacy, you know, how many of you have um, a, a neighbor that you don't want to look at? Their house, their car, um, uh, an empty lot that's untended, a commercial space. Maybe you have a busy street next to you, or maybe it's just a few doors down, but you hear it or you smell it. Um, there's so many different things that we might want that privacy from. It's also a great way to create um, just a sense of privacy, a coziness in our yard, uh, a way to kind of define the space. Um, a native plant hedgerow like this one in this photo is basically a fence um, instead of a fence, right? So lots of different uh, benefits there, both for wildlife and for us living in, in our spaces. Um, so a native plant hedgerow is basically creating a grouping of plants. Um, usually I recommend um, creating a, a simple grouping, one or two species of large shrub and one or two or three species of small shrub and then some ground cover plants. Just create that grouping. I mean, it could be as tight as like four or five different plants species and then just repeating that grouping down the line. That is a hedgerow. So um, I always recommend incorporating some um, evergreens in there as well. Um, but by repeating it, you're offering multiple plants that are blooming at the same time, which is beneficial for pollinators, but you're also offering multiple different kinds of plants that give you different blooming times. So blooming throughout the season, but also multiple plants blooming at the same time for pollinators when they are blooming. Um, that way you're getting also different textures, colors, um, and, and um, you're creating more shade and cooling effect. 
Um, I know for me, I would always rather prune than weed. So um, yeah, some suggestions. Um, so uh, a grouping that I love is a red flowering currant or mock orange, which like uh, will take both shade and sun. Um, so they're adaptable um, with snowberry and evergreen huckleberry. Um, depending on the intensity of the sun in that location, you might kind of tuck those evergreen huckleberries in where they're getting a little more shade from those other plants, um, or maybe they're a little happier out. Um, but that way you've got some evergreen in there as well. Um, and then um, some ground cover plants. It might be woodland strawberry. It might be fringe cups. It might be, if it's sunny or California poppy. Um, if it's shadier, it might be ginger or um, oxalis or inside out flower. So just a, a tight grouping. I often recommend snowberry um, and um, our native um, birch leaf spirea um, because they're, they're pretty adaptable to, in, um, to multiple conditions. Um, so plants for pollinators. So there's a lot of interest in um, meadowscaping or wildflower meadows. Um, so offering plants that are blooming at different times throughout the year so that pollinators have food sources throughout the year, um, rock areas, bare ground for creating um, the, the little um, mud, uh, mud places for, for um, laying eggs. Um, flower constancy is what I was just referring to of having multiple things blooming at the same time. So you might have um, red flowering currant that blooms early and mock orange that blooms later in the spring, but having multiples of those same things. So the multiples of the same thing is offering those pollinators um, because they get a taste for something and they say, oh, that's tasty. You know, is there more of that nearby? Where, where's that? So they go looking for some more of that. So offering multiples of the same thing blooming at the same time, but also multiple bloom times. Um, and then um, some uh, things with different kinds of hollow stems can be beneficial for things like mason bees. Here we have some examples of um, throughout the seasons. So some spring bloomers. I've got uh, California poppy blooming in my yard right now. Camas blooming right now. The red flowering currants are just about done. Uh, the yarrow is budding. Uh, summer bloomers. So um, our Douglas spirea, columbine, foam flower, snowberry. My snowberry is blooming right now. There you're actually seeing um, their, their um, berries. My, my stuff's a little early. So if yours aren't blooming yet, don't worry. <laughs> My stuff definitely is a little early. I'm, I'm in a really exposed sunny place. And then fall, fall bloomers. Um, Douglas Aster, once you get a little, you'll have a lot. Um, yarrow continues to bloom a lot throughout the season. Uh, native and non-native yarrow. Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, when the native plant thing first got popular in gardening, maybe, oh geez, 20 years ago, um, we saw a lot of uh, prairie plants, echinacea, coneflower, uh, black-eyed Susan, and the golden yarrow. So you'll see a lot of golden yarrow planted. It's a lovely plant. I'm not going to tell you it's bad. It's really lovely, but our native yarrow is the white yarrow. Um, it can even look a little dingy. Sometimes it can look a little pinky, but it is basically white, and it's quite a, a happy spreader. Um, offering water. Um, that can be a very easy way to offer uh, wildlife stewardship in your yard. Keeping cats safe at home. It's better for the cat, it's better for the wildlife. Here's a really creative example of a, a catio using reclaimed materials. Uh, this uh, is not a great image, but it's basically talking about removing lawn and sheet mulching using cardboard or newspaper to cover the lawn, to kill the lawn, and then covering it with um, wood chips or bark mulch. Um, basically, I love sheet mulching because sheet mulching just gives you an opportunity to clean up an area and not worry about it while it's doing its thing and you can think about other things. It gives you some breathing room especially if you're feeling overwhelmed, especially for 
people who've just bought homes or new homes, first time homeowners, it can be a really great chance to get a little breathing room while you make a plan, think about what you're doing. And you can also often get chips from Chip Job Free. Uh, here's a quick DIY rain garden approach. Uh, yeah, free plants online, free rock online. Uh, yeah, lots of different opportunities to gain these um, if you plan it out and think about when those resources are available. And I think there's one. Yeah, okay, there we go. So any of the questions? Um, Feel free, I think uh, Emily is gonna throw up a final um, poll about if you have um, things that you've learned from this and you um, have new, new ideas about things you wanna do in your yard. Um, if people have questions, I believe Emily will also open up your mics. So um, be aware if you're gonna do that, Emily, or also yes. feel free to type in the chat. Yay! Water source, add sticks and leaves from your yard, native, plant native plants, remove noxious weeds, add a mason bee house. Oh, numbers are shifting. Yeah, water, water source is so easy. Keep the, yeah, don't keep a tidy garden. Just let the sticks and leaves be there. It doesn't have to be right in the middle of the grass, but let them be there. Uh, add a birdhouse. That birdhouse, you can do, um, nesting cams and is really fun stuff you can do with watching uh, a nest house with kids or not with kids. Uh, copy the slides. I don't know if we have a way to do that. However, I know this entire webinar has been recorded and should be made available. Um, and perhaps Emily or Shauna can tell you how or post how that will be available later. Yeah, so um, I'll get Shauna back on here too, but yeah, she's going to make that available soon. Um, give me one moment. Yeah, and so you made a comment about um, uh, sometimes slopes can be too steep and, and the risk of um, erosion can be too severe um, to want to uh, endanger your property or other properties for um, redirecting stormwater. It's definitely an issue in certain locales. Uh, replacing lawn with permeable path um, to reduce path. growth through of grass and weeds. Yeah, that can be an issue. Um, I know a lot of people want to mortar in their, their stepping stones and um, path stones because of that. Um, so having the path built right in the first place is important. So proper layers of underlayment of rock and uh, uh, sand and probably weed cloth in there somewhere. Um, that's important. But also, um, you know, if it's a problem, I think it's more an issue of maintenance and not letting it get out of hand. And so I always recommend um, if you do have a weed problem somewhere, getting on it as quick as possible. Um, the weed seeds can come in, they can blow in on top of the surface. So which is why I never recommend a weed cloth for, for planting beds um, because those weed seeds come in on the wind and they can land in all sorts of ways and in between pavers and rocks in those crevices is, is really common. So um, I use a straight solution of vinegar to spray in those problem areas. At my house I have a rock wall that comes down to the sidewalk and I get all kinds of things growing there. So straight vinegar is really effective. You can also, if it's all hardscape um, and rock and it's safe, you can use a kind of, I don't know what it's called, but a, a, I call it a flamethrower um, where you can actually burn the weeds. You can do that a couple times a season. That's effective. Just be aware of fences and wood mulch and things like that and don't catch anything on fire. Um, but yeah, that, those areas are gonna end up being maintenance areas. 